Welcome to an overview of the Incident Command System for ICS for ICS. My name is Mark Boddy, and I am a support engineer with Monaco Monitoring, Inc. I've worked in remote monitoring for a little over 15 years. Prior to that, my background was in various IT roles supporting Windows, Solaris, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I started my Incident Command System journey in 1986 as a firefighter EMTB with a rural volunteer fire department. It would be another 10 years before our county adopted the Incident Command System. I've moved, and since my fire department days, I've volunteered with Amateur Radio Emergency Service in various roles, and currently, I work with a great bunch of folks on an all-hazards Type 3 incident management team. I currently have the all-hazards Type 3 planning section chief and the communications unit leader Type 3 personal task book open. But enough about me, let's get going. The Incident Command System, or ICS, is a standardized approach to incident management. It is used for all kinds of incidents, by all types of organizations, and at all levels of government and non-government organizations. ICS is applicable to small incidents as well as large, simple to very complex ones. It can be used not only for emergencies, but for planned events such as fairs, gubernatorial or presidential inaugurations, parades, or marathons to name a few. It enables a coordinated response among various departments, jurisdictions, and agencies. It establishes common processes for incident level planning and resource management and it allows for the integration of resources such as facilities, equipment, and personnel within a common organizational structure. The incident command system was developed following the catastrophic 1970 Southern California fire season. The season spanned 13 days, 16 lives were lost, over 700 structures were destroyed, more than 500,000 acres were burned, and damages were more than $234 million. You put that in perspective, that is the November 2021 equivalent of $1.7 billion. The personnel assigned to study the case histories and determine the causes of these disasters discovered that response problems could rarely be attributed to a lack of resources or failure of tactics. Surprisingly, studies found that response problems were far more likely to result from inadequate management than from any other single reason. An interagency group formed in Southern California calling themselves FireScope. FireScope stood for Firefighting Resources of Southern California Organized for Potential Emergencies, and they set out to develop two interrelated yet independent systems for managing wildland fire. Those two systems were the Multi-Agency Coordination System, or MACS, and the Incident Command System, or ICS. It is important to note that while the initial focus was on fires, they, as a group, understood the system would work for any hazard. In 1976, an unofficial shift began to replace fire-specific references and move to more generic terms that would apply to all hazards. The U.S. Coast Guard recognized they needed a new plan after the Valdez incident in March of 1989, and in 1991 they used ICS for the first time in a collision between a container ship and a fishing vessel. In 1998, it was ordered that all U.S. Coast Guard hazard responses utilize the incident command system. ICS is used every single day by first responders, emergency managers, and in non-government organizations in the U.S. and around the globe. While primarily used for emergencies, it is also used for planned events. Events such as the Olympics, inaugurations, county and state fairs, local parades, marathons, the list goes on. The use of ICS is applicable to all types of incidents regardless of their size, cause, or complexity. As a system, ICS is extremely useful. Not only does it provide an organizational structure for incident management, but it also guides the process for planning, building, and adapting that structure. Using ICS for every incident or planned event provides a practice that is needed to maintain and improve skills necessary to effectively coordinate larger or more complex efforts. Before going any further, we need to talk about the National Incident Management System, or NIMS. Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5 was issued on February 28, 2003, directing the Department of Homeland Security to establish a single, comprehensive national incident management system to enhance the ability of the United States to manage domestic incidents. NIMS is a systematic and proactive approach to guide all levels of government, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector to work together to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the effects of incidents. NIMS provides a consistent foundation for all incidents ranging from daily occurrences to incidents requiring a coordinated federal response. NIMS is organized into three major components and represents a core set of doctrine, concepts, principles, terminology, 
and organizational processes that enable effective, efficient, and collaborative incident management. Resource management describes standard mechanisms to systematically manage resources, including personnel, equipment, supplies, teams, and facilities, both before and during incidents to allow organizations to share resources more effectively when needed. Command and coordination describes leadership roles, processes, and recommended organizational structures for incident management at the operational and incident support levels, and explains how these structures interact to manage incidents effectively and efficiently. Communications and information management describe systems and methods that help to ensure that incident personnel and other decision makers have the means and information they need to make and communicate decisions. The cornerstones of NIMS are Multi-Agency Coordination System, or MACS, and the Incident Command System, or ICS. Sound familiar? This follows what FireScope determined many years earlier. It is important to note that the Incident Command System is just one part of NIMS. ICS is based on 14 proven NIMS management characteristics, which are shown here in no particular order. They include management by objectives, reliance on an incident action plan, a modular organizational structure that can be tailored based on the size, complexity, and hazards of an incident, command of this organization is established under a single incident commander or a unified command, Chain of command is a predictable hierarchy or organizational structure, while unity of command provides an individual with a single supervisor to receive direction from and do answer to. Maintaining a manageable span of control. Implementing comprehensive resource management practices. Establishing designated incident facilities and locations. Small incidents with just the IC may still require an officer space where the IC can work out of and meet with others. Accountability for resources utilized and money spent defines clear processes for dispatch and deployment of resources, and ICS supports responders and decision makers through effective information and intelligence management, using common terminology, and ensuring communications is integrated into the process so responders know how to contact others. You must coordinate on what your end objective is. All up and down the chain, you must have a common end goal. So you can establish your objectives, you can ensure they're in the incident action plan, and you can ensure everyone agrees. Using ICS ensures all the different departments or organizations work under the same framework. ICS counts on everyone taking personal accountability for their own actions. And finally, the mobilization process helps ensure the incident objectives can be achieved while responders remain safe. ICS benefits. The incident command system has positively impacted incident management efforts by clarifying chain of command and supervision responsibilities to improve accountability, Leveraging interoperable communication systems and plain language to improve communications. Providing an orderly, systematic planning process. Implementing a common, flexible, pre-designed management structure. Fostering cooperation between diverse disciplines and agencies. Without ICS, incident responses typically result in a lack of accountability, including unclear chains of command and supervision. Poor communication due to both inefficient uses of available communication systems and conflicting codes and terminology, lack of an orderly systematic planning process, no common, flexible, pre-designed management structure that enabled commanders to delegate responsibilities and manage workloads effectively, and no predefined methods to integrate the interagency requirements into the management structure and planning process effectively. Using ICS enables us to avoid these weaknesses in all types of incident responses. ICS is built on best practices. The Incident Command System has been tested for more than 40 years of emergency and non-emergency applications by all levels of government, non-governmental, and private sector organizations. By using management best practices, ICS helps to ensure the safety of responders, employees, and others, the achievement of incident response objectives, efficient use of resources. The ICS organizational structure develops in a top-down, modular fashion that is based on the size and complexity of the incident, as well as the specifics of the hazard environment created by the incident. As incident complexity increases, the organization expands from the top down as functional responsibilities are delegated. The ICS organizational structure is flexible. When needed, separate functional elements can be established and subdivided to enhance internal organizational management and external coordination. As the ICS organizational structure expands, the number of management positions also expands to adequately address the requirements of the incident. 
Management by Objectives. The Incident Commander, aka IC, or Unified Command, aka UC, establishes incident objectives that drive incident operations. Incident objectives are used to ensure that everyone within the ICS organization has a clear understanding of what needs to be accomplished. Priorities for incident objectives are number one, life safety, number two, incident stabilization, and number three, property and environmental preservation. Management by objectives includes establishing smart objectives, specific, a detailed explanation of what we want to accomplish, measurable, what metrics are we going to use to confirm we've met the objective, achievable, the task at hand must be possible, relevant, the objective must help solve the problem, and time-bound, we must set a realistic time frame to accomplish the task necessary to meet our objective. Identifying the strategies, tactics, tasks, and activities to achieve the objectives. Developing and issuing assignments, plans, procedures, and protocols to accomplish the tasks identified. Documenting the results for the incident objectives. Incident action planning results in an incident action plan, or IAP. Incident action planning guides effective incident management activities through the development of an incident action plan. An IAP is a concise, coherent means of capturing and communicating overall incident priorities, objectives, strategies, tactics, and assignments in the context of both operational and support activities. The IAP should focus on addressing the needs of future timeframes called operational periods. Every response has a strategy, like a teacher's lesson plan, called an incident action plan or IAP. To be effective, an IAP should cover a specified time frame or operational period, be proactive, determine what is needed for the upcoming operational period, specify the incident objectives, state the activities to be completed, assign responsibilities, identify needed resources, and specify communication protocols. Even the smallest of incidents are managed by incident objectives and plans. Plan can be as simple as the next steps the incident commander plans to do, and they can be communicated orally to the rest of the ICS organization. For smaller or less complex incidents, the IAP may be oral or written, except for hazardous materials incidents, which require a written IAP. FEMA has developed a series of ICS forms for use in developing a written IAP. Chain of command does not prevent personnel from directly communicating with each other or to ask for or share information. While formal direction and control follows the chain of command, informal information sharing occurs throughout the ICS structure. Span of control refers to the number of individuals or resources that one supervisor can manage effectively during an incident. If too much responsibility is given to the supervisor, the span of control may become unmanageable. The manageable span of control on incidents may vary depending upon the type of incident, nature of the task, hazards, safety factors, and distances between personnel and resources. Maintaining a manageable span of control is particularly important at incidents where safety and accountability are a top priority. Typically, span of control is from three to seven subordinates, with the optimum being five. More than seven creates a new branch, less than three might get absorbed by existing branches. Effective incident management may require ratios significantly different from these, so this is a guideline and incident personnel should use their best judgment to determine the appropriate ratio for their situation. In a unified command, there is no single commander. Instead, the Unified Command manages the incident through jointly approved objectives involving multiple ICs. Unified Command allows agencies with different legal, geographic, and functional responsibilities to work together effectively without affecting individual agency authority, responsibility, or accountability. Unified Command is typically established when no single jurisdiction, agency, or organization has the authority and or resources to manage the incident on its own. Chain of command relates to the overall hierarchy of the organization while unity of command deals with the fact that all individuals have a single designated supervisor they report to. The communications goes up and down the chain in this scenario. There is no correlation between the ICS organization and the administrative structure of any single agency or jurisdiction. This is deliberate because confusion over different position titles and organizational structures have been a significant stumbling block to effective incident management in the past. While the chain of command and unity of command are applied in all incidents, the actual command structure itself and the responsibilities of those involved change based on the type of incident and your specific role.
Each section and individual units can communicate amongst themselves and make quick field level decisions. This is a very important point. Every incident requires that certain functional areas be implemented. The problem must be identified and addressed. A plan to deal with it must be developed and implemented, and the necessary resources must be procured and paid for. Regardless of the size of the incident, these functional areas are all required. In smaller incidents, one person can fill more than one role. There are five major ICS functional areas. Incident Command sets the incident objectives, strategies, and priorities, and has overall responsibility for the incident. Operations conducts activities to reach the incident objectives. It establishes all tactics and directs all operational resources. They solve the problem. Planning supports the incident action planning process by tracking resources, collecting and analyzing information, and maintaining documentation. Logistics arranges for resources and needed services to support achievement of the incident objectives. Resources can include personnel, equipment, teams, supplies, and facilities. Finance administration monitors costs related to the incident. They provide accounting, procurement, time recording, and cost analysis. The standard incident command system organizational structure is shown here. Incident command, which could be a single incident commander or a unified command, will lead the effort and, as needed, assign command and general staff. The ICS organization is unique, but easy to understand. There is no correlation between the ICS organization and the administrative structure of any single agency or jurisdiction. For example, someone who serves as a director every day would not normally use that title when deployed under an ICS structure. They would use the ICS title of the position that they were assigned to within the ICS structure. This is deliberate because confusion over different position titles and organizational structures has been a significant stumbling block to effective incident management in the past. NIMS defines command as the act of directing, ordering, or controlling by virtue of explicit statutory, regulatory, or delegated authority. When you are using the incident command system to manage an incident, an incident commander is assigned. The incident commander has the authority to establish objectives, make assignments, and order resources. To achieve these ends, the incident commander works closely with staff and technical experts to analyze the situation and consider alternative strategies. The incident commander should have the training, experience, and expertise to serve in this capacity. Qualifications to serve as an incident commander should not be based solely on rank, grade, or technical knowledge. The incident commander is responsible for the overall management of the incident. Overall management includes command staff assignments required to support the incident command function, and the incident commander is the only position that is always staffed in ICS applications. On small incidents and events, one person, the incident commander, may accomplish all management functions. In addition to having the overall responsibility for managing the entire incident, the incident commander is specifically responsible for ensuring overall incident safety, providing information services to internal and external stakeholders such as disaster survivors, agency executives, and senior officials, establishing and maintaining liaisons with other agencies participating in the incident. The incident commander may appoint one or more deputies. If a deputy is assigned, he or she should be fully qualified to assume the incident commander's position. The incident commander is responsible for all incident command system functional areas until she or he delegates a function. Since the ICS organization is modular, it can expand or contract to meet the needs of the incident. During a larger incident, the incident commander may create sections and delegate the operations, planning, logistics, and finance administration responsibilities. For a very small routine or short duration incidents, it is possible that the incident commander will not establish any of the staff positions. In this case, the incident commander will personally manage all ICS functions. The ICS Command Staff Depending upon the size, type, and complexity of the incident or event, the incident commander may designate personnel to provide information, safety, and liaison services. In the incident command system, the command staff may include the public information officer, or PIO, who serves as the conduit for information to internal and external stakeholders, including the media and the public. Accurate information is essential, and the PIO serves as a primary contact for anyone who wants information about the incident and the response to it. The safety officer, or SOFR, monitors conditions and develops measures for assuring the safety of all personnel and is responsible for advising the incident commander on issues regarding incident safety, conducting risk analysis, and implementing safety measures. The liaison officer, or LOFR, serves as the primary contact for supporting agencies assisting at an incident. 
Additionally, the LOFR responds to requests from incident personnel for contacts among the assisting and cooperating agencies and monitors incident operations to identify any current or potential problems between response groups. A command staff may not be necessary at every incident, but every incident requires that certain management functions be performed. An effective command staff frees the incident commander to assume a leadership role. Incident commanders may also choose to appoint technical specialists such as legal, medical, science and technology, or access and functional needs to act as command advisors. Take a look at how the overall incident is coordinated. Coordination involves the activities and ensure the on-site incident command system organization receives the information, resources, and support needed to achieve those incident objectives. Coordination takes place in several entities and at all levels of the responders, non-government organizations, and government agencies alike. Examples of coordination activities include establishing policy based on interactions with company executives, government agencies, and stakeholders, collecting, analyzing, and disseminating information to support the establishment of shared situational awareness, establishing priorities among incidents, resolving critical resource issues, facilitating logistics support and resource tracking, and synchronizing public information messages to ensure that everyone is speaking with one voice. The command and coordination component of NIMS defines these structures and explains how various elements operating at different levels of incident management interface to achieve the maximum effect through a shared understanding. Effective incident management consists of four overarching areas of responsibility. Direct tactical response to save lives, stabilize the incident, and protect property and the environment. Incident support through resource acquisition, information gathering, and interagency coordination. Policy guidance and senior level decision making. And outreach and communication with the media and public to keep them informed about the incident. These objectives are accomplished using the incident command system, security or emergency operations centers, multi-agency coordination groups, and the Joint Information System, respectively. The General Staff. The person in charge of each section is designated as a Section Chief. Section Chiefs can expand their sections to meet the needs of the situation. As shown here, they report directly to the Incident Commander. When the IC designates an Operations Section Chief, the staging and management of operational resources moves from the Incident Command to Operations. If no Operations Section is established, the Incident Commander will perform all operation functions. The operations section is responsible for directing and coordinating all incident tactical operations. In other words, operations works to solve the problem. The operations section implements the strategies and develops the tactics needed to carry out the incident objectives, supports the development of the IAP to ensure it accurately reflects the current operations, organizes, assigns, and supervises the tactical response resources, is typically one of the first organizations to be assigned to the incident, develops from the bottom up, unlike the ICS organization which develops from the top down. It has the most incident resources and may have staging areas and special organizations. The planning section. The planning section chief is responsible for planning and documenting the IAP. The planning section manages incident information and maintains situational awareness for the incident. Tracking of resources assigned or checked in to the incident. Maintains documentation for the incident. Plans for and implements a demobilization process so responders can give back any equipment checked out, such as computers, radios, shovels, and deliver any paperwork to the document unit leader or crew time reports to finance admin before they are officially checked out of the incident. The Logistics section. Logistics is responsible for ordering, obtaining, maintaining, and accounting for essential personnel, equipment, and supplies. Provides communications, planning, and resources. Could be radios, could be cell phones, voice over IP phones, or fax machines. Provides meals for responders. Facilities such as housing, showers, and porta potties. Support transportation to get responders from their housing location to their work assignments. And providing basic medical services to the incident personnel. The Finance Administration section. Finance Administration is responsible for contract negotiation and monitoring, making sure we have enough money to pay for the resources we need and then account for every penny spent to ensure it doesn't go over that amount. Timekeeping to track responders' time working, using a crew time report. Compensation and claims, compensation for injuries or damage to property. 
procurement, operations needs are unicorns and rainbows, otherwise known as stuff, and documentation necessary for reimbursement under mutual aid or assistance agreements. Incident Command System is used every day by first responders and is part of the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, as mandated by HSPD-5. Every responder knows who they answer to and where, where to go for direction. Roles and responsibilities are clearly defined by ICS for the ICUC, the Command and General Staff, and through the Incident Action Plan for responders. Span of control ensures supervisors do not have too many subordinates so they do not lose focus. Utilizing the same language means parties from different departments or outside agencies can communicate clearly and understand each other. Any individual familiar with ICS can use ICS regardless of the organization. In addition to unplanned events and emergencies, it can be used for planned events. It really should be used during planned events to give the participants the experience needed to better perform their roles during an unplanned event. Prevents a mob of people showing up to help and enables a coordinated response among all involved parties, groups, partners, and outside agencies. And utilizes a common process for planning and managing resources, be it personnel, equipment, or other needed supplies. Accountability. Accountability during incident operations is essential. The ICS structure will need to abide by agency policies and guidelines and any applicable local, tribal, state, or federal rules and regulations. There are several principles you need to adhere to. Check in and check out. All responders must report in to receive an assignment, and checking out is just as critical as checking in. Incident Action Planning. Response operations must be coordinated and as outlined in the Incident Action Plan. Unity of Command. Everyone will be assigned to only one supervisor. Personal Responsibility. ICS relies on everyone taking personal accountability for his or her own actions. Span of Control. Supervisors must be able to adequately supervise and control their subordinates as well as communicate with and manage all resources under their supervision. Resource Tracking. Supervisors must report and record resource status changes as they occur. Accountability starts as soon as a resource is requested through the time that the resource returns to their home base safely, tracking all incident-related costs from the startup until the incident is shut down or closed. This is just a glimpse of the Incident Command System and what it can offer you and your company. To learn more, for free, you can sign up for independent study classes on the FEMA Emergency Management Institute website. Use DuckDuckGo and search for FEMA space EMI. Once there, start with the following three classes. IS-100, Introduction to the Incident Command System. It's approximately two hours self-study which introduces the Incident Command System and provides a foundation for higher level ICS training. It describes the history, features, and principles and organizational structure of the Incident Command System and explains the relationship between ICS and the National Incident Management System. IS-700B is an introduction to the National Incident Management System. This course provides an overview of NIMS. NIMS defines a comprehensive approach guiding the whole community, all levels of government, non-governmental organizations, and their private sector to work together seamlessly to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the effects of incidents. The course provides learners with a basic understanding of NIMS concepts, principles, and components and is approximately three and a half hours. G402, NIMS Overview for Senior Officials. This is a classroom-based class, but your search results include a downloadable PDF of the student guide. It is directed towards elected and appointed officials, but is easy to apply to business executives, so it is worth the time to review it. The in-person class is about four hours. Also consider these other classes as most incident management organizations require them as a minimum. IS-200, Basic Incident Command System for Initial Response. IS-800, National Response Framework, an introduction. ICS-300, classroom-based as an intermediate ICS for expanding incidents. ICS-400, also classroom-based and is advanced incident command system. With the pandemics, ICS-300 and 400 are being offered virtually in some localities. My experience has been the classroom is where you will really learn. It's great to understand the principles, but it is far more important to be able to put them in practice working with others, and you simply cannot do that online. Thank you for your time reviewing this.